Hi folks, welcome back to another podcast with me, Olive Leaf. Thank you for joining me. For anybody who's been around since I started these podcasts, I am sorry I have been away for a little while. Let us call it a hiatus. It sounds a fancier way of saying I just haven't done any for ages. But I'm back. I am better than ever. Well, I mean, that is entirely based on your perception, but I hope I am. And I'm ready to podcast more regularly to bring you much more fun, entertaining history. Firstly, I would like to say that I hope everybody is keeping well and healthy and happy and sane in lockdown, wherever you may be. Um, This is a crazy time to be alive. 2020 was not the roaring 20s I had envisioned. It's been roaring in many different ways, all of them horrible. So wherever you may be right now, whatever you may be doing, whatever's happening, what time it is, wherever you are, whatever, all of the other whatever's when, who, what, when, hows, I'm sending you some love, I'm sending you some health, and I hope that we will get through this as unscathed as possible. So, on to the topic of today's podcast. What better way to escape the modern chaos of the world than by talking about magic? Although, as usual, you know by now, if you've listened to my other podcasts, that I'm going to take a bit more of a historical approach. But let me start by asking you whether you believe in magic. Do you believe in spells and wishes? Or are you more of a superstitious kind of person? Like, you don't really believe in that kind of stuff, but you'd rather hedge your bets by not walking under that ladder or stepping on those cracks. I get you. That's cool. Whatever floats your boat. I think magic is everywhere. I talk about it regularly. I have a tattoo of the word on my arm. I'm a big fan of magic. What is magic to you, though? To everybody, it's something slightly different. So if you take a second, even pause this podcast. How many times have I said podcast in this podcast? Sorry, it's clearly a podcast. I need to get over myself. Anyway, if you pause this and take a second, maybe this is like a little bit of mindfulness, but to you, think about what is magical to you. I don't mean to sound all kind of love and light, but it could be something that inspires you. It could be nature. Like I look at the moon and stars on a clear night and I literally can't even understand how we exist and how the stars and the moon exist and how the moon is so pretty and how no matter how many times I try and take a picture on my phone, it still looks rubbish. I have to, well, I bought a camera specifically only to take pictures of the moon for that exact reason. But to me, the moon is magical and nature is magical all around me. I hear the song of birds. I hear... The rustle of the wind through the trees, and to me, that makes me feel a part of something bigger, which to me is magical. Great, that's just me. Stop talking about me. I literally asked you to think about what you're doing and think about what you think magic is. So maybe it's a rainbow, because let's be real, I know there's a science behind it and everything, and it's all about prisms and water droplets and stuff, but seriously, rainbows are just mental. Like you're just walking along and then bam, colour everywhere and then it's all gone you, and you can't find the end of it and I, I just don't really get them, even though I do get them, so don't I don't need everybody to explain the science to me, like I technically get them but in my mind I don't get them. Anyway, rainbows may be magic to you. It could be a sunrise, it could be how humans develop technology that means you can speak to your family halfway across the world and it's like they're in the same room as you. Do you find music magical? The way people can pick up instruments and play them? The way pieces of wood and stuff on them make incredible sounds? Is that magical or for you is it art? A painting, how you can see a whole new world in a piece of paper? I don't need to give you a billion more examples, I'm getting a bit distracted, but the point is Magic can be found everywhere. It doesn't just have to be confined to witchcraft and spells or superstitions. It's a term that can now be applied in many different contexts to things you find wonderful or miraculous. And speaking of miraculous, that brings me on to the main point of my podcast. What is magic? But precisely, 
what is the difference between magic and religion? Now, this isn't some sort of clickbait where I've said I'm going to talk about magic, but actually I'm going to try and convert you all to a new religious cult that I've just created. No. The reason I want to talk about magic and religion is because they've always been really, really closely linked, and that connection can help us understand both religion and magic in this context. So, classic me, in order to answer the question I've just asked you by posing a new comparison, religion and magic, I'm now going to go religion and science as a sideline to get back to my original topic, which is not great writing, but it's the way I talk. So, somebody could believe that the beginning of the universe was a magical explosion, completely explained by science, but just based on the absolute fluke of the right circumstances at the right time, creating life as we know it. To another person, the creation of the universe is a wholly religious occurrence created by one god or many gods, if you have a different religion. I'm basing this primarily on Christianity because that's what I got taught because I went to school in England. I've picked this debate between Big Bang slash creation because I refuse, quite frankly, to get embroiled in a flat earther or anti-evolutionary debate because I won't be able to be unbiased, but those would also be relevant here. The point is, we see a fairly clear-cut distinction between religion and science. That is not to say that you can't believe in both. Many religious people are scientists, and vice versa, even though the vice versa is essentially the exact same thing. But anyway, the two can live quite harmoniously. So for a religious person, their god or gods was the one who instigated the scientific discovery in many circumstances. So that's how the two can live quite harmoniously together. My point is, when it comes to religion and science, we can fairly neatly put them into separate boxes. But we can't do that when it comes to magic and religion. Well, we can't do it as easily anyway. The distinction is far more wibbly. So if we talk about pagan magical practice for a minute, which is what most people nowadays, if I talk about magic or witchcraft, instantly understand that as a pagan thing. So if we break it down a little bit, you can be of any religion or without a religion to practice witchcraft. It isn't a formalised religion in itself, it's a practice. You can obviously get more organised forms akin to religions within the heading of pagan. For example, Wiccans, they often follow a standardised practice and belief, but you can be a witch and not be a Wiccan. So if that all makes sense, I won't need to go into this in more depth and get more waffly. In the same vein, you can actually be Christian and a witch. I bet loads of people's heads are exploding right now, being like, but what about Salem? I'll get onto that later, I promise. But I come from an Irish family, and I have heard many family stories of my great aunt, who regularly read people's tea leaves and was uncannily accurate, and who could see ghosts visiting people's houses and could tell when someone was going to die because they heard a penny drop behind them, which is a trend that has been seen throughout the rest of my family and other aunts, and is terrifying, and nobody knows whether to really believe it or whether to just ignore it. Anyway, she was a Catholic. So is reading someone's tea leaves a Christian thing? No, <laughs> not really. Is it more akin to paganism? Yes. So in this sense, magic is more closely linked with pagan religions than Christianity. But is that always the case? Christians believe, either metaphorically or literally, that Jesus walked on water, shared a few loaves of bread among thousands of people, and turned water into wine. Those things seem pretty magical to me, but Christianity labels them as miracles instead, while Tolkien labels the bread Lembus bread. No, I'm kidding. Uh, anyway, accidental Lord of the Rings sidetrack, sorry. To unpack the what is magic question, I want to unpack this magic versus religion versus science debate just a little bit more. But before I do that, I want to say a bit of a disclaimer, really. I'm going to be talking a bit about medieval England and Christianity. I think it's especially pertinent at this time when people are being killed for the colour of their skin or for their religious beliefs in what I can only describe as a literal destruction of humanity and everything humanity should stand for, like equality, respect, love and justice. So as all of this seems to be crumbling around us and we all need to take action, I just wanted to state that I'm not using Anglo-Saxon England or medieval England and Christianity 
as examples to bolster any white supremist Anglo-Saxon Presbyterian kind of complex. I could not be more against any of those twisted beliefs. I am not a wasp, if you know what that means. I'm only focusing on medieval England quite simply because that's the topic I know best. That's the era that I'm studying for my PhD and that's, I'm not an expert yet, but one day that's the area I will be an expert in. I would love to discuss the abundance of other cultures and religions and histories spread across the world, but I don't want to disrespect anyone's heritage by hopping on Wikipedia for five minutes and suddenly doing a podcast and pretending that I know everything about their culture. I am not an expert, and I don't want to take that away from people who are, and my voice be heard while others aren't, and they know way more on these subjects than I do. There are so many incredibly rich and wonderful societies in the world now and in the past, but I'm not going to Coachella this podcast by just chucking in a few quick references to Native Americans or Spanish or Egyptian cultures, because quite frankly, I'm not educated enough to talk about them on the internet yet. I do strive to constantly educate myself about other cultures and other religions and belief systems to make sure I'm as much of a rounded and unprejudiced person as I possibly can be, especially in witchcraft. There's a lot of white Western imagery going on about kind of the love and light, like I mentioned earlier. So I'm, I'm really not buying into any of that. But for the sake of this lockdown podcast, I am just going to be safe and stick to what I know. I just felt that was all important to get out even though it was a somewhat political message, sometimes that's necessary and I don't want to offend anyone and I just want to say I'm doing a PhD in medieval history and English, so I feel like that's probably what I should be talking about in a podcast and that's the only reason. <coughs> don't be racist. <coughs> okay. Okay, well, despite all that, I'm actually going to go back even further than the medieval period and go back to when humans were just becoming humans. So if we think about the evolution of our brains... Ooh, it got technical quickly. This is the portion of the podcast also where I butcher people's names. So two fellas called Gould and Lee Wanton were people who proposed a theory about spandrels, which are byproducts or traits or qualities that don't have any adaptive value on their own. So they took the term from architecture originally. And if we look at biology, for an example, the human chin could be considered a byproduct of the way the jaw grows. So the chin, because it doesn't really do anything useful, I mean, unless you're chinning someone in a fight, if that's a thing. I don't really fight people, so I don't know, headbutting maybe. Anyway, for no reason really other than accidental is the chin there. Which if you start to think about it in too much detail and you start to look at your face too much, nothing makes sense anymore. But anyway, the chin would be considered a spandrel. Now I'm looking at my face and I'm reevaluating everything. Like I used to think eyebrows didn't serve a function other than to mark what decade it was based on the thickness of the brow. But I've recently discovered they originally kept out stuff like rain and sweat from going into your eyes. And now I found out the chin has no function. It does none of it make sense anymore. Anyway, the spandrel theory applied to this topic can help us understand our perceptions a little bit more. So there are two camps of thought on this, and you can pick whichever one you're in. Are you a Stormcloak or are you an Imperial? For all my Skyrim friends out there. Or to be more hip, it's not really hip anymore, but are you Team Edward or Jacob? Because there's a new Twilight, I think, at some point coming out. I don't know. I don't really like Twilight. Anyway, one camp let's call them the Stormcloaks in this instant, believe that religion is a spandrel of psychological evolution, which means it was possibly a byproduct of our expanding brains when we got loads more grey stuff in our brains. So despite the heightening intelligence and ability of evolution enabling us to understand the world and our place in it, we still weren't fully able to understand the scale of the universe. So a byproduct of this enhanced brain was religion, a way to understand the things that we couldn't understand otherwise, namely the scale of the universe. Like, if you think about it now, if you think about how small the Earth is compared to other planets and to the sun and to other galaxies and black holes and how time and sound travel weirdly and differently in space and how when you're looking at a star, you're actually looking back in time because that 
star has already been and existed and might already have died and it's a long time ago basically and then we're seeing it ages later I, it just makes your head swim a bit so our brains aren't big enough really to fully conceptualize all of this it's not just you feeling like a fool which sometimes i think it's just me but it's not we we can't understand that we're too tiny so religion came about as a way to bridge that gap by placing a higher being in charge of all of those crazy things. So instead of scaring ourselves with how small we seem and how out of control everything feels when you don't know what's going on outside the earth, we could instead believe in a god or goddess figure to aid this understanding, which was far more relatable. So while it wasn't an adaptation in itself, the Stormcloaks believed that it just came about from our expanding brains and was just a byproduct, like a chin. If we cross over and go to the Imperial camp, they believed that religion itself is an adaptation and that originally it served a key function and was considered a useful trait and useful enough to keep in the evolutionary process and keep throughout and become who we are now. We may not know what the original motivation for religion was, maybe it was to aid social cohesion or something, but whatever stance you take, whether you're a Stormcloak or whether you're an Imperial, the ability to believe and conceptualise religion is hardwired in our brains. In this case I'm saying religion, but I'm also meaning magic or science, as many people believe in these and they're the structure by which they live their lives. The point is, we all need to believe in something, so even if you're a staunch atheist and you're shaking your head listening to me, you believe in something somewhere and your brain is predetermined to have that sort of belief. I'm going to stop now because it's going to go into the realm of evolutionary psychology and biology, and I am not any of those things. So, let's take a look at some of the things that divided medieval England. They couldn't decide if these things were magic or holy, if they were pagan or if they were Christian, and it caused endless issues, let alone burning all those people in the later medieval, early modern period. Again, I will talk about them, but not quite yet. So let's get into some of the things that divided medieval England. Medieval? I don't usually say it like that. Anyway, people couldn't decide whether these things were magic or holy, or whether they were pagan or Christian, and it caused endless issues not even including burning all of those people in the later period. Not good. But it all started before that with... Omens. Good or bad? Like some sort of creepy blockbuster. Anyway, omens are kind of like superstitions. So at the beginning when I asked you, do you believe in superstitions? Then I was kind of foreshadowing this section of my podcast. In the medieval period, omens were often believed to be actually signs from God, so even things like meteors would have been considered by most common people as an actual sign from God. That's why when you go, especially around places like Wales or Ireland or Cornwall, you get loads of places like the giant's ring, giant's thumb, the devil's punch bowl even. These are all geological or natural phenomenon, phenomena, phenomena uh, phenomena, padre, anyway, uh, that people explained by saying they were godly or in some instances magical. So giants would probably fall into the more magical category and devil, obviously, more Christian. Oh, that in itself is a whole topic that I, uh, I could do a separate podcast on. Magic and paganism and Christianity through the landscape. That's kind of just my undergrad dissertation, which was how did we see King Arthur in the landscape? So, throwing back to my archaeology undergrad days. Anyway, sidetracked, reminiscing, sorry. Basically, people believed these things were signs from God. Yes, right, we understand that. But as early as the 4th century, St. Augustine decided that omens were a serious problem, and he often mocked them in order to attack them, because we all know mockery is the highest form of attack. Not legislation, not scriptures, not any other Christian thing. Mockery. Absolutely classic. He saw them as an issue because even though they weren't magical in their own right, they weren't summoning anybody, he believed demons might use people's superstitions against them 
to the demon's advantage. So if demons saw people adhering to omens, for example, if a dog howled in a house and then people believed someone would get sick or they would die, the demon would then intervene in that omen and make that come true, therefore distracting people from their faith in God and making them believe in the omen. And this is why he believed omens were magic, just as any other demonic communication would be. Ooh, demonic communication would be a really good tongue twister. Demonic communication, demonic communication. And that's quite hard, actually. Anyway, it's interesting that in condemning omens for being magical, not in their own right, but because they may allow demons to come in and twist people's minds against religion, that the belief in demons was really, really real. He really believed that demons would intervene with humans and that this later concept of witchcraft was already around this early on. So other 13th and 14th century contemporary writers used mockery when discussing omens. So an exemplum was a moral story, kind of like a proverb, but I don't know why it's called an exemplum instead. But anyway, there was this 14th century friar called John Bromyard, and he used an exemplum to mock a common omen. He said that there was a belief that meeting a monk or a friar on the road was bad luck and it was an ill-fated omen. So in his story, there was a woman walking down the road and she saw a priest and she immediately crossed herself with the sign of the cross to ward off the bad omen. Well, the priest was not happy, firstly because of her blatant lack of respect towards him, treating him like he's some sort of demon, and also he was annoyed that she even believed in this superstition. So he walked over to her and he pushed her in the ditch. Absolutely awful priest. He also made the point that believing in omens is far more dangerous than actually meeting a priest. So he just rubbed that in her face as he pushed her in a ditch. And ditches in the medieval period were filled with absolute awful stuff. You don't want to even know. That poor woman... The irony was that he had actually proved the superstition right. It is bad luck to meet a priest on the road because he might push you in a ditch. He, whatever happened, he was just an a-hole. Pardon the expression. Either way, omens were a touchy subject because so many people believed in them. It doesn't matter if... It's kind of the same with any society. Well, it is exactly the same as any society. Just because of everything that's happening at the top level doesn't mean it filters all the way down through. So even though churchmen might say don't believe in omens, if somebody, if old Alf down the road heard a bird caw or a crow or something caw five times and he thinks, well, that means I've got five years left to live, is he going to think, oh no, but the church told me not to believe in this? Or is he going to do some sort of little charm or have some sort of object on him to ward off that superstition? Probably the latter, because that's probably the safer bet than just getting rid of it. Because if you don't know if you believe in something or not, it's better to hedge your bets. So if you don't know if walking under that ladder is bad luck, probably don't walk under it just in case. That's why the church had quite a lot of difficulty trying to get people to actually stop believing in this. To be honest, the church had that issue with most of the pagan world that they were trying to Christianize. That's why they incorporated so much of pagan culture into Christianity. So Yule and Christmas and Easter and Ostara and all that kind of stuff was all merged. Like if you, I mean, basically every person who's into magical stuff will tell you Christmas trees, Christmas presents, Yule logs, all of those things were all viking norse traditions painting easter eggs were also painting eggs at ostara was also a fertility symbol and that's like an easter egg hunt so all of these things were kind of pre-existing potentially and that were all brought into christianity to merge the two so when people converted to christianity it was a lot easier and even in saying that anglo-saxons many anglo-saxon kings were the first to convert and they only converted in name and they got baptised just for political reasons, but they didn't actually believe in anything. They just believed in their pagan gods anyway. So it was that kind of slow adjustment. For a long time, you could believe in both. There's lots of tombstones that have both pagan and Christian imagery on them. So they were there was a lot of merging. So omens, trying to get rid of them, tricky subject, tricky for them to do, demons everywhere. 
If we move on from superstitions and omens now, we can talk about astrology. Now, astrology is not a new thing, not just because the stars have been around since forever, but because medieval scientists genuinely studied astrology and believed it could predict patterns in the natural world, in the human body, and even the weather. You had to really know your stuff, though, and there were some intense mathematical calculations involved. So 15th century Richard Trewithian, I think, was an astrologer and a medical man, and he left loads of intricate notes and calculations that proved that he did a lot of complicated stuff that I don't understand, and I won't try and explain it. Despite being spiritual myself, I have never been any good at astrology, though. I know I'm a Libra sun, Capricorn moon, and Gemini rising, just because I put my birth info into Cafe Astrology online, and there were lots of sextiles involved conjunctions and nodes that I don't understand. I just know that these three things combined make me a fair-minded justice warrior who's a bit of a control freak and who is curious and quirky, which might explain the disclaimer midway through and the constant Skyrim references, but I don't understand it really. <laughs> I don't understand the other planets. I don't understand much, it would seem, but a lot of people know a lot more than me so I'm not going to try and go into it in too much detail but the interesting thing is it's complicated now but it was way more complicated in the medieval period you know, people often think that back in the day the older further back we go the more stupid people were but this is totally not true like we can google stuff and we don't know the answers you can do that in medieval England you can do that in Neolithic Britain like you had to just work out stuff and I've worked at Stonehenge. I've seen those stones. I know that that's so hard. I don't know how they got them across. Again, similar to rainbows, I technically understand kind of how with lots of logs and rolling and cattle and pushing and stuff, but I still don't really get it. Nobody really does. It's just basically, it would be wrong. Don't assume people in the past were dumber than we are just because we've got Wi-Fi, because... Just look at 2020 and see what a mess we're making of the world. Not very clever. Anyway, as usual, getting sidetracked, back to medieval astrology. So the University of Paris's medical school thought, ready for big words, the malignant conjunction of the planets was one of the causes of the Black Death in 1348. So in this sense, astrology was considered a natural science. Clever people were allowed to do it, so religious people agreed that it was okay, basically. And it was restricted to people that had an education, rather than that old elf that we talked about earlier who lived down the road in a shack with one tooth and three brain cells, but could still count how many times a cuckoo called. I think it's a cuckoo that meant that you were going to die. Anyway, Alf and his friends were the people that were susceptible to demons, and that's why the churchmen worried about magic. But... Apparently, if you were smarter and had an education, then you were safe, I think? Christian law kept a kind of peace in the hierarchy it created, if it was obeyed. So superstitions, black cats and voodoo dolls and any kind of magic jeopardised that hierarchy and that law. Lots of people hotly debated the topic, from Thomas Aquinas to a German friar called John of Freiburg, and lots of other fancy, clever blokes. But basically, if astrology was used to predict the future, but only to see what was happening with nature, like weather or droughts and that kind of stuff, then astrology was totally cool, everybody was happy, even the church. But if astrology was used to predict stuff that might happen in someone's life, that's when it got a bit dodgy. So if it was like a personal prediction, then that's when it was magic. But if it was a natural prediction, that's when it was science. Sound a bit wishy-washy? Yep. So if we go back to Augustine, he decided that astrology was magical, false and totally condemnable. He didn't even bother to make a distinction between science and magic and all that kind of stuff. To him, it was all baloney. There were no good bits or bad bits. And this is where we get to the key point. I mean, it's only taken me 29 minutes and 27 seconds to actually get into it, but we've enjoyed the ride. Basically, in medieval England, there were two branches of magic. First, we have natural magic, 
which was considered a branch of science. And then we have demonic magic, which was the bad one and was obviously about demons and was considered a perversion of religion. So cavorting with the devil and all that fun stuff. Don't actually summon demons, kids. It could get hairy. It sounds like a nice and easy way to define magic. Good or bad or black or white. It isn't though. If you have a person using natural herbs to make medicine to heal someone, that sounds like natural science, right? Aha. But in the process of doing their healing, what if that person is actually calling upon demons to do their bidding and thus heal that person? It could be for their own selfish reasons. Healing sounds like a very nice, kind way of doing stuff, not very demony. But maybe if that person dies, the person doing the healing loses all their money or loses their income or something like that. Maybe they don't want somebody to die until they've given them the location of their secret treasure, etc. So even though they're using plants and natural magic, in that instance, what if they're also summoning demons, therefore doing the other kind of magic too? In the same way, if you've got somebody deep in the dark woods at midnight summoning demons, but they're using natural herbs or animal skins, are they not also using natural magic because they're using natural resources to summon the demons to therefore do their bidding? So because we don't know the intent behind it in the Middle Ages, because we can't go back in time unless we look at a star, but anyway... We don't know their intent, so you don't know if demons are involved or not. Now let me ask you this, listener. Do you have a funny-looking freckle? Is that freckle actually a mark of the devil and where your familiar suckles? No. Okay, well that that's later witch trials when everything got all twisted and dodgy, but it, you can see how that distinction however wishy-washy and vague it was then, just got perverted to basically just make women suffer later on um, and exploited for the witchcraft and the witch trials. Speaking of the witch trials, at last, I'm only going to briefly mention them because I'm not an early modern historian, but many of the women, now they weren't all women, some men were um, prosecuted for witchcraft, particularly in Europe, but many of the women who were were elderly, some of them were widowed or they were never married. So these women were often women controlling their own lives. Women who also couldn't have children at that point, maybe if they were too old or were barren, couldn't have kids. Therefore, they had no real purpose to society. What is the point of a woman unless she be a vessel for more children? How lovely. Therefore, if she wasn't any of those things, she wasn't any use to society anymore, she must be a witch. She uses herbs to heal people, so she must be summoning the devil and sleeping with him every full moon in the forest and being bad. You get the picture. You can see how easily that distinction between natural and demonic magic was twisted and corrupted in the witch trials of the later medieval period. Ironically, though, to banish a lot of evil spirits or a lot of technically pagan things, holy water or incantations of the Lord's Prayer quite often were used to banish these things. But in doing so, if you say the Lord's Prayer three times, one of them backwards, cross yourself and do a spin and, I don't know, lick a tree, that kind of sounds like a spell, does it not? And using holy water that you have charged to make it holy sounds very similar to the pagan practice of charging water under the moonlight or even the folk practice of on May morning, on the first day of May, maidens would go out and collect all the dew and then put it on their faces and be beautiful. All of these things sound very, very similar with holy water. Blessing a house with holy water. Is that not a magical ritual in itself? Is a ritual to a pagan deity or is it to a Christian god? These lines are so blurred and, as I said already, it's all about the intent behind them. The Collins Dictionary definition of magic is Magic is the power to use supernatural forces to make impossible things happen, such as making people disappear or controlling events in nature. Whereas the definition for religion is Religion is a belief in God or gods and the activities that are connected with this belief, such as praying or worshipping in a building such as a church or temple. 
So here lies the distinction. One is about the supernatural, and the other is about a belief in a higher being. But it is a difficult distinction nowadays, especially because they're so closely related. And if we find it this hard, imagine how hard medieval churchmen found it to work out a distinction. And here's where the issue lies when you're a 21st century person trying to work out what happened in the past. It's very easy to let our own conceptions of magic and belief and religion cloud our judgment of the past or to assume some sort of hindsight. We can look back and think, oh, well, that was really obvious. But to the people living it, it wasn't necessarily obvious of a distinction. It wasn't obvious what was happening. You have to remember that communication in those days was really difficult. It took a lot longer. You can just WhatsApp someone and ask them a question and then shoot it back through to your boss and bish bash bosh, you've all sorted your next law. It was really tricky. So what matters is what the medieval people believed. They had to struggle through ideas like what is the difference between divine prophecy and magical forms of divination? If you pray for health, how is that different for an amulet for health? And if you say one is okay, how can you say one isn't? It's really tough. And in this period, lots of Greek and Arabic books on magic started to get translated and spread, especially in England and the rest of Europe. And it just made it way harder. You've got even more stuff to contend with now. Let's take the language, for example. So medieval words for magic included the Latin sortilegium. I'm saying it really, really phonetically because you can't see it written down. And also I can't really speak Latin, which meant originally lot casting became more akin to magic in the 12th century, which kind of makes sense. If you cast your own lot, it's kind of linked with the future and prophecy and that kind of stuff. Then there are rarer words found in manuscripts like maleficium, usually meaning some sort of negative magic that's sought to harm. Then you get arts magicae, which clearly means magical arts. Necromantia or nigromantia, which originally meant invoking the dead, but later became associated with demons instead. And then you have older, old English terms in the Anglo-Saxon period, including wickercraft, the ancestor word for witchcraft, geldocraft, which was linked with incantation and song, or libcraft, which meant potion work, syncraft related to delusions of phantasms, and wiccan or wiggleras were terms for magicians, likely destructive magic according to the law codes of the early 11th century by Archbishop Wolfstan II of York, why do they have such long names? Because the punishment was death. Harsh. But that means that it was clearly considered some sort of crime to be a Wiccan or a Wiggleris. Then you have other words like Heiftis or Hegtessa, which is a form of hag, meaning an old woman who had some notion of prophecy but was horrible looking, gross, but was actually also really good at fighting quite often. You just see all these different terms floating around that I have really badly mispronounced from the Anglo-Saxon period and from the medieval period onwards, and it's just a minefield. Belief in fairies was strong as well. Fairies or fae or elves who caused harm, or in later medieval romance, who were really hot and seduced people a lot. But I'm swerving to, a bit too close to folk traditions and literature. That's a subject for another podcast, if you're keen, but I'm going to stick to magic specifically before I waffle on. The term witchcraft originally would have been used by medieval churchmen and would have been interchangeable with the word magic. And I'm speaking largely of medieval churchmen because they're the ones who wrote most of the stuff down, or at least who influenced the legal codes that were then written down, because religion was a big deal and there were lots of documents of it. Old Alf, who lives down the lane, we're not we're not bored of him yet. He didn't know how to write or keep a diary, so we don't have evidence of his life. We just go by the church, annoyingly. Witchcraft instantly makes you think of witch trials, the big hunts, but we've all seen the films of Puritans shouting witch at you if you sneezed funny. But witchcraft during the 15th century and later became associated specifically with witchcraft, not magic. So I know that sounds a bit convoluted, but... They were almost separate things because in witchcraft, in this sense, referred to people who practiced magic, renounced God and pledged their souls to the devil, as well as holding sabbats, aka meetings. They could probably fly. They had extra nipples or witch marks for suckling their familiars, definitely had loads of orgies, slept with the devil as well, 
probably killed and ate children and just genuinely worshipped the devil in many other horrible ways and black magic and all that kind of stuff. All the stuff I joked about, but it's actually true. <laughs> it's what they thought. So I better not mention that I have a pentagram tattoo on my ribs. Probably shouldn't put that on the internet either, but never mind. Witchcraft became a specific thing that was condemnable and almost a crime. Well, it was a crime, but almost its own thing. Whereas if I go back to my great auntie who read tea leaves, magic has obviously remained kicking around and widely accepted for centuries within religion, despite the condemnation of witchcraft. In the mind of the church, magic and witchcraft were two very different things. But to a modern audience, they're basically the same, which kind of brings me just to my final point on what is magic. It's kind of, it's, I mean, it's like when you watch a film or when you read a story and then it's like, and then they woke up and it was all a dream and then you feel really cheated because that was ridiculous and it didn't have a proper story arc. So I feel a little bit like that saying, what is magic? Well, what is anything? It's all based on what you think it is, what the intent behind things are and what you deem the terminology to make it. Are you one of those connoisseurs that when they see art, they say, okay, well, that's art. And then they see modern art and they're like, no, I'm not calling that art because sometimes that is me. And I don't like going to modern art galleries sometimes because I feel cheated that I could have also put a lamp on a table and got millions of pounds for it and didn't think of it. But despite that, the issue of what is magic now, as you can see, to summarise, over the years it's been hotly debated, it's been condemned, it's been celebrated by people that believed in it, it still is celebrated by those who believe in it, it is still condemned by many people. Um, it's not fair, it's the same way that many people that don't understand stuff seem to just hate it or are prejudiced against it nowadays. But magic is a belief in the supernatural, something beyond us, not necessarily a higher being, not necessarily a god or goddess. It could also equally be those things. I study Arthurian literature and in lots of the romances there are characters who are magical, they have magical powers and can cast spells, but there are a lot more characters who have supernatural powers, knights that can hold their breath under water for nine days or can grow as tall as the tallest tree. We don't necessarily see them demonstrate this, but the inherent supernatural ability seems pretty common. But then if you look at Arthurian literature, it's quite often very Christian in some of its overtones. Things like the Grail, for example, very Christian, but it's very neatly fitted in and everyone's very happy about it. So it seems in literature they can coincide nicely. It seems in the conversion to Christianity it can coincide quite nicely, but it's later down the line when things get a bit messy. So to conclude, what is the point of this podcast? Well, it's been to give you a bit of a background into some of the trials and tribulations not quite literally, because I didn't go into the witch trials in too much detail, but some of the issues behind assessing what magic is, assessing what religion is, thinking about what you believe. And if you take anything away from this, apart from that moral tale of the priest pushing a woman in a ditch, I want you to go away and maybe just think about some of the beliefs that you hold and some of the things that you consider either at odds within yourself, if there's two things that you can't quite define, or if there's things that you very neatly defined, maybe just go over and reassess them and see if you're accidentally holding on to any prejudices that you didn't realise. Think if you have not made connections before between different elements of your life and you feel like you're missing something. Just take a moment to be mindful of who you are and what you believe, really. And if you believe in magic, great. If you don't believe in magic, great. That's entirely up to you. But find something that you do believe in, and if you have the power to, which I'm sure we all do within us, go out and change whatever you want to change in some way. Do some good in some way, and make a bit of a difference for what you believe in. And if a cuckoo 
calls, which at this time of year, I mean, I don't really think cuckoos call. Cuckoos hoot? No. Cuckoos sing? I don't know. Cuckoos call. If you hear it call a certain number of times, that don't worry, you're not going to die. Um, old Alf probably did, but probably not because of the cuckoo. Probably because of plague or something. But consider yourself in a way that you've maybe not considered yourself before and look at things that you took for granted as just part of things that you believed, like those medieval churchmen having to really deconstruct every different aspect of magic and religion and astrology and separating it all into these different brackets to try and make it as clear as possible. In their instance, it was to tell people what to do and what not to do for church law, which is probably not why you're going to be doing it, but it's good to be introspective and it's good to think of these things. So I hope that this podcast has taught you a little bit about medieval views on magic and religion. And I hope it's been educational within yourself and within a historical magical setting, because that is what I aim to do. Thank you so much for listening. I hope wherever you are, you are happy and healthy and staying sane, keeping yourself busy or not. We don't need to be productive in this time if you're struggling. That's okay. Allow yourself. It is a global pandemic. It is not a time to necessarily be the most productive you have ever been in your life. If all you have done of any use is listen to this podcast, at least you have done that. Well done. I A, am grateful for you listening and B, congratulate you for listening to something that's actually fairly informative, if a little squiffy. But peace out. I will catch you guys soon, and bye for now.